I personally think that Balmora is a gruesome house, uh, totally charmless, no grandeur, no distinction, big, ugly, dull, oppressive. But for Victoria, it was a dream house in which she could play out her fantasy. I think in Balmoral, Victoria was making a Waverley novel you could live in. From the exterior to the decoration inside, I think Scott would have loved Balmoral. It's such a shame that he didn't live to see it. I mean, he would, he would probably have, have made it even more romantic and slightly phony. The royal family had also been attracted to some Spartan conditions. The outside cold could drop as low as minus 27 degrees centigrade, giving the monarchy the chance to battle the elements. One of the uh, interesting things about Balmoral is it's absolutely freezing. Braemar is, uh, uh, which is of course very, very close indeed to Balmoral, is the coldest part of Great Britain. So it is a very, very, very cold place. So it was a brave place to choose, and certainly was in its own way, a struggle with nature on the part of the royal family. <laughs> Victoria loved the cold. There was nothing more Victoria liked than a nice, chilly day. In fact, she would constantly throw the windows open all the time and leaving the ladies in waiting, shivering in their fine silks. In fact, the Tsar claimed that Balmoral was colder than the waste of Siberia, and Lord Clarendon claimed he had frostbite in his feet from having to be in Balmoral, because it was just so cold. It's always raining there. It rains morning, noon and night. It just rains horizontally, seldom vertically. They have rude rain up there, as the locals call it. It doesn't go round you, it goes through you. Um, the rain there circulates in the air for hours at a time because it just blows horizontally and doesn't ever touch the ground. So you can meet the same squall two or three times in the same day. Miserable place. Victoria relished conquering the cold on her frequent walks in the hills. Austere picnics were almost a daily occurrence. We sat on a very precipitous place and here, at a little before two o'clock, we lunched. The luncheon was very acceptable, for the air was extremely keen. Well, they went out in all weather, um, on sort of pony rides, uh, on sort of picnics, on these great expeditions. I mean, Queen Victoria wrote about it at length, describing these wonderful, um, rather romantic expeditions. I mean, the reality was, I think, that it was terribly cold, and when it wasn't cold, there were awful midges. On these excursions, the royal family would meet the locals. Albert thought the Highlanders looked like Germans. The people are more natural and are marked by that honesty and sympathy which always distinguish the inhabitants of mountainous countries who live far away from towns. The locals, for their part, seemed only too happy to wear the kilt, to put on a display of Scottishness for their queen. I think Victoria's clear, authentic love of, 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 of Scotland plays very well in Scotland, that it's going to be a very, um, she's bound to be a very popular figure because of that, and, and, and she is, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Scotland was also moulding Victoria and Albert. Within the walls of Balmoral, they wanted to reinvent themselves as Scots. The tartan extended from Balmoral's carpets to the royal attire. Even the workers were required to wear plaid. Yes, Queen Victoria and Albert were 50 years behind their times when it came to fashion. And um, that continues in the royal family to this day in, in many ways. And um, it was a sort of perhaps historical thinking or traditional thinking. They didn't want to be fashionable. They didn't want to compete with uh, London society. The family apparently took to wearing kilts um, for dinner and Albert designed his own special tartans just for the pair of them. And this is, a, this is almost a type of patriotism, because up until then, the best fashions were always French fashions. And here was Victoria saying, we don't want French chefs. We don't want French fashions, French lace, all this stuff. I want tartan and I want porridge. Balmoral gave the monarchy the opportunity not only to create their own style, but reinvent the world in which they lived. Far from the riots and stench of London, they could create a new model society. Balmoral gives them a chance to, to um, run a sort of 
medieval fairy tale in many ways because they can exert patronage, they are um, peasant people living around, they can, can visit them in their huts. It's escapism. Courtier Charles Greville remembered the daily activities of the Queen. She is running in and out of the house all day long and often goes about alone, walks into the cottages and sits down and chats with the old women. There was a huge nostalgia in the 1830s and 40s for the Middle Ages, for the dream of order, for the wholesome feudal loyalties that had existed in the Middle Ages. So Queen Victoria was going up and seeing all these marvellous Scottish things and, and saying, this is what I like, because it, it actually helps the whole business of, of, of loyalty to the crown, and the crown is part of that great tradition. Nowhere was this feudalism more evident than at the Highland Games. Throwing the hammer, tossing the caber, putting the stone. We gave prizes to the three best in each of the games. Victoria and Albert were great fans of the Highland Games. Hail hearty subjects throwing things around and seeming as if this was the epitome of British strength. They could just chuck cabers and that sort of thing. It was all perfect. Victoria herself was kind of almost like some kind of chieftain. I am the queen, but I'm also the tartan-clad chieftain of all of you. I think with Victoria and the Highland Games, you have a kind of idea of honorary feudalism. It is to an extent dressing up and, and, and playing the role. There's no real power there. And I mean, if you think about it by analogy, it's perfectly safe to dress up as a Viking or a Jacobite or a knight from the Middle Ages. It's only in these kind of dead costumes that the ceremonial can find its, its chance to relive the days of power. Balmoral also provided another theatrical backdrop against which to play the role of a royal, the animal kingdom. Victoria loved animals and she loved nature. As a little girl, she loved her ponies, she loved her animals, as do our current royal family. And there were animals everywhere. There were stags all over the place. This was a place of great nature. As for Albert... <laughs> uh, Albert was an extraordinarily bad hunter. He uh, went out in a day's deer hunting and came back with, uh, with a hare. Um, he got himself portrayed spearing salmon, which is one of the most difficult, with a, with a leister, with a, with a fish spear, which is one of the most difficult ways you can have to catch fish. He was re reliving the past in doing that. And it, once he got so frustrated that when he was at uh, breakfast with his host and the tamed, his tame stag came to the window to be fed, Albert shot him. He didn't go in for the sort of rather more delicate British habit of just killing the occasional thing. He wanted a massacre. The stag is first used as a symbol of the Stuart dynasty under siege in, uh, in Denham Cooper's Hill, where the killing of the stag is symbolically seen as the killing or the, the attack on Charles I. So in actually hunting the deer in Scotland, was, uh, was both, in a sense, symbolically killing off the Stuart dynasty, but realizing the inheritance of the Scottish royal family back to its earliest foundation myths. Albert's conquests of nature were presented to the monarch as immortalized in oil paintings. The English artist Landseer created the ideal stag in the monarch of the glen. I think nobility, dignity, honor, integrity, the stag possesses all these things and uh, the hunter in pursuing them is outwitting the creature and the, the difficulty in outwitting the creature is an important part of that. And Lancy and Victoria get on very well. I think Lancy um, is important in nurturing that Highland sensibility in Victoria. He um, instructs Victoria in, in drawing and, 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 and watercolour. So, um, Landseer's painting, I think, just becomes part of the package of the Highlands for Victoria. It calls to mind everything about the Highlands that she values. Balmoral has even given us a new term, coined in Victorian times, Balmorality, signifying a combination of patronage, respectability, 
Scottishness and the great outdoors. Balmorality, a very important concept because, as has been often said, the crown is the symbol of ourselves behaving well. And if people who have the crown upon their heads behave badly, it shakes the whole foundations of the throne and of the monarchy. It was the values of moderation and respectability that enamoured Victoria to the Presbyterian Scots. She was respected because she was a mother. Uh, she was serious. She seemed to embody the values that particularly middle-class Scotland agreed with. So she was very much an icon, uh, and she was incredibly popular. Balmoral's influence spread far. In Victoria's wake, English aristocrats adopted her rituals in Scotland. I remember once seeing on the front of Tatler after a particularly grievous general election result in the 1990s, seeing this thing that, uh, uh, this headline which said, how we love our Highland playground. And you know, this, is, this has been the, the, the sort of attitude of the, the sort of high British establishment to Scotland ever since Victoria's day, that Scotland is this, like this little bit on the edge where you go in August um, and where you shoot and where there's lots and lots of empty land with, with nobody much in it um, and where, where one has one's, one's sort of shooting and hunting and fishing kind of holiday. As novelist Anthony Trollope would later write, in the shooting season, dukes were more plentiful than in Pall Mall. The middle-class English, too, were keen to explore this new landscape. Thomas Cook tours to Scotland started in 1846, with hundreds flocking to see the world of Walter Scott and now Queen Victoria. Balmoral had helped create a Highland brand. Rather than a modern industrialized nation, Scotland had become dramatic glens and Highland cattle. I think that Victoria and Albert popularised that romantic conception of the Highlands tremendously. I think by buying Balmoral and remodelling it the way she did and uh, repeatedly coming back to Scotland and the value that she placed on Scotland gave tremendous impetus to that Highland identity. The tartan industry also took off. By covering Balmoral with tartan and adorning those around her within it, Victoria promoted the once illegal Highland dress. You know, if the most famous Scotsman in the world nowadays is a character from The Simpsons that wears a kilt, has red hair, a fiery temper and drinks too much whiskey, um, we can't wholly blame Scott and Victoria for that, but they certainly set the sort of preconditions whereby that idea of Scottishness became an international brand. Balmoral had also become a symbol of the union of the two countries, empowering both the monarchy and Scotland. This is perhaps unique to Victoria's reign, that by her period, the monarchy had become an additional keystone, an additional important support of union, in a way which monarchy had not been before, because there was all this kind of symbolic representation of Britishness on the one hand, but the great thing for the Scots was that she was proud of and tried in a, in a sense, uh, in a very explicit sense, not only by her visitation, but by her love for Scotland, to recognize Scotland's identity within the Union. In 1861, Prince Albert became seriously ill. As Albert lay dying, Victoria read him Walter Scott's Peveril of the Peak. There's a very touching copy of the Waverley novels in the Windsor Library, where you can see the copy of Peveril of the Peak that she was reading to Albert on his deathbed and they put a black border around the very page that he died on. It's not a very good page. I mean, you can see why he <laughs> didn't want to get to the end of the book. 